The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Welcome to my presentation. It is aptly entitled, Where to Go and How to Get There, Using Free and Open Source Tools to Plot Your Map to the Future. A um, couple things before I start. Has everybody enjoyed Southeast Linux Fest? Yeah. Woo! Okay, no, it's not over. There's a keynote. I believe it is right here in this room, which will have magically expanding doors. Uh, about 15 minutes after I'm done, so I hope you guys stick around for that. Did anybody get a hot dog lunch today? Yeah. All right, did anybody donate food to the food drive for loaves and fishes? Yeah. Thank you very much, Beefy Miracle. Thanks to you, people from loaves and fishes. Thank you also. Um, just a couple notes from here off my slide before I start. Number one, who knows about the law of two feet? Okay, law of two feet for the rest of you. Uh, I know you guys have all come here from places near and far. Uh, if you get five minutes, 10 minutes, 40 minutes into this talk and you say, wow, this stinks, I encourage you to use your feet and go do something better with your time that you think is better for you because you're only here for a day or two days, so make the most of your time, please, by all means. Uh, second off, I know some people are like, hold your questions to the end, not me. Pipe up, stick your arms up in the air and ask away. Um, my information here. What? Oh, yes. And I will say, the question was, uh, this is my email address. Um, if you would like to harass me now or later, you can find me on Twitter um, or praise me. That is also recommended. I like that stuff. Uh, so today, I hope that you actually learn something while you're here. Um, number one is how the heck do I get my community on the road to somewhere? So we're going to look at this in a sort of admittedly incredibly simplified fashion. Um, it's the version of my three steps to progress. Uh, the second thing I hope you learn is basically what free and open source software tools are there that will help me to do these types of things. Um, I encourage you all to use the FOSS. Duke. Um, so, about me, I am the, uh, well, I am that. So, I have a, a long and varied background. Um, when I was 19, I ditched out of school because it was 1998. Hey, you could make a lot of money on that internet thing. And so, uh, I became a system administrator at Motorola. Um, I admin AIX machines, like 80 of them, in a production environment where we made computers, ironically enough, um, so most of my job was really coming to work at two in the morning on Saturday nights during bachelorette parties because I had a pager um, and helping people print labels and stuff like that. So I'm still recovering from that whole thing and to all of you who are sysadmins, you guys do great work and good job. Um, so yeah, that was pager days. Um, Oh, I'm skipping ahead. Yeah, so those were my pager days. Um, after that, I went and became an industry analyst. I wrote lots of reports um, about how great the internet age was and how much money everyone was going to make. I was one of those people that didn't pan out so well as some of you may remember from the year 2000, 2001. After that, I went to a big chip manufacturer called Intel. Um, I did forecasting on processors. So now I am the Fedora project leader at Red Hat. Who here uses Fedora? Wow, that's a, I like seeing those hands. That's good. Um, so my job is to lead, work with the community in sort of a open and transparent fashion. Um, I'm responsible for maintaining a good line of communication between Red Hat and Fedora. Of course, everyone in the community is responsible for maintaining good lines of communication with each other anyway. Um, but, but part of what I do is working with people internally who may not be part of the community at Fedora, and reassuring them that we are not going crazy and that if they paid attention to us, as they normally do, that, that we're doing awesome. So that's a lot of, a lot of my job. Um, 
I am not Mel Gibson in Braveheart. I do not have blue face paint. I don't walk around with swords. I like building consensus. Um, swords are bad, they're sharp, so. Uh, the M in this equation is mom, so that's the other thing I do in my, my spare time. Um, I have two kids. They're lovely, their names are Lauren and Warren. Um, motherhood is interesting. Uh, that was what happened when I left Intel. You can read into that however you'd like. I was able to spend eight years at home with my kids, which is, you know, a privilege, and, you know, I'm very happy that I did that. Um, so, during those eight years, I became very good at dealing with children. So, um, yeah, I'm good at breaking up fights. I'm good at teaching people how to act like civilized human beings, cleaning up disasters. I'm good at that, making executive decisions. All these things I learned by having children, but the number one thing I learned that is applicable to my job right now comes from Dora. Who has kids? All right, who here has seen Dora? All right. Okay, so for those of you who live a better life than the rest of us, uh, Dora, <laughs> Dora, <clears throat> Dora is a kids show on Nickelodeon. Dora lives somewhere, Central America, South America, they don't really ever say, uh, but she basically teaches kids a couple Spanish words in every episode, like hola, or you know, whatever it is that they're talking about that day. But most of the focus of the show is on friendship and caring and perseverance and getting places. So the standard Dora plot line looks like this. So Dora is someplace, it's usually at her home or maybe she's at school, and then something absolutely terrible happens to her. There's really bad stuff. And so she consults her animated map, a little singing map. He dances around. And he says, Dora, you need to get to the blank to do blanking blank, right? And then she does it. She has some friends, you know, Benny the Bull and Issa the Iguana and a couple other people. You'll notice none of them ever wear pants. Very strange. Um, usually Swiper the Fox, Sneaky Fox Swiper comes along and he totally screws up her day. Not cool, right? So. I'm going to be applying a couple lessons from Dora to getting your project places. So um, number one is, uh, as community people, we sort of have the tendency to ignore the rest of the universe and meander along on our merry way to nowhere until something horrible happens, like a Swiper the Fox or, you know, whatever. Don't wait for Sneaky Fox Swiper to come along and make you have to make decisions. You know, it's good to always know what your path is and not have to wait for Swiper to be the impetus for you to make decisions. Um, don't get off your path if you have distractions. Um, the other thing is being transparent about your game plan. You know, this is easy for Dora. She's got a map, she opens it up, she tells her little buddies without pants. Um, that's good, you know, in community land, we need to write these things down so that everybody understands it. Uh, other thing to remember, Animated talking maps do not actually appear for you in real life, unless you're in a car and you have Google, um, but sometimes you have to forge your own life. So uh, the first thing that you want to think about as so you're getting from point A to point wherever down the road is where are we now, okay? So in saying this, I'm going to assume that we're all starting from blank slates. You have no game plans, or maybe Swiper the Fox has come and screwed up your day, but this is the, the first step in, in what we're looking at here. Um, why is this important, right? Like, doesn't everyone in my community know like what we're doing and where we're at now and you know what, what's going on? Okay, so who here has ever tried to take a large group of people to dinner? Right, so first you're like, Okay, who's allergic to fish and, oh, right, you're a vegan and you only eat bacon and, you know, you've got all these things, right? And then someone else is like, oh, I ate there last night. I really don't want to eat there again. Oh, it's also $400 a plate, so, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that, right? We also don't want to drive, like, 40 miles away to Italy to go to eat. That would be, you know, silly. So, um... Knowing where you're at helps you to make reasonable decisions about where you're going in the future. So if we harken back to the, uh, the dinner example, right? Tonight we are not going to be going to dinner in Paris. 
right? Because we are on the other side of the ocean. You know, we only have our legs. So having dinner in Paris tonight is a goal, sort of a bad idea, not very realistic. Um, so while some, of, while some of this may seem pretty obvious, um, it's not surprising when you think about it in terms of a community, where people want to get somewhere that is a billion miles away in six months, do, you know, it's nice to have goals, but sometimes you need to be realistic, so I like to encourage that. So, tools for figuring out where you are. So, the number one thing I like to point out to people is, you know, finding data points and also making sure that they can be reusable over time, right? So, if your goal is, let's say, uh, we want to get more people to, to use stuff, right? You know, if you decide on a goal at some point down the road, you want to know, like, things like, oh, are we tracking downloads? You know, do we have these kinds of numbers available? Because that would probably be helpful to tell if we're, you know, making progress as we get down the road. Or if our goal eventually becomes we want to have more features in our competitor software, right? Know what the heck you have right now, because otherwise you're not going to be able to count. Um, surveys is the other really interesting thing that you can use to get sort of a, a feel about where you are right now, just from, from general community members. What you don't want, to, well, I guess you could do is go out and ask other people what they think about your community, but you may not want to mix those two particular surveys up. So if you go and ask people um, what it is that you're doing, um, how do you feel about the project today, you know, what, what do we think our goals are right now, those types of things really help you to get a good feel for where we are on the map, you know, right now. Point A, what is it? Because if you don't know where you're at, really hard to tell you where you're going. Also, Dora, Dora has a paper map. Her cousin Diego, he has a GPS, and it's part of his supercomputer, and it's just very cruel. It turns into airplanes, not fair. So, let's assume and now I'm skipping the part where this is all going to be very sort of dramatic and people are going to, you know, there might be grumbling or anger, but we're going to assume that this went along swimmingly. Um, once you have this, where are we now, um, that is a good starting point, right? Because when you're there, you now can start thinking about where do we want to go? Where can we actually go? What's a reasonable destination? How long is it going to take us to get there? Uh, where do we want to stop along the way? So things like milestones, et cetera. Um, I think the most important thing about this is really being realistic, um, not bursting people's hearts. Uh, so to that end, um, I think knowing that you have reasonable chances of success is good. Um, demoralizing people, you know, saying we're all going to do this and then six months later they feel like they don't have any progress, you know, not very awesome. Um, this is probably the most difficult part of what you do because no one is ever going to agree on, you know, what is this thing that we want to be, you know, a year or two years from now. Um, so, you know, communities have lots of types of personalities and people contribute for different reasons. Um, so while we all want to say that, we, you know, we don't want to leave different types of people behind, um, it's at some point you need to accept that you can't please everybody. Um, some people, you know, sometimes it means that some people just aren't going to be along for the ride and, you know, that sucks, but you can't always, you know, please everyone and please everybody's needs and, you know, not be a jack of all trades. Speaking of jack of all trades, I have a personal anecdote that I would like to share with everyone for this, uh, as an example of how that type of thing could go wrong. So, I worked at the large processor manufacturer, which I mentioned previously, which I will not now name by name. Um, and I worked in the embedded group where we basically repurposed processors that were really cool like four or five years ago into new little embedded devices, right? Because whenever a big manufacturer would come out with a new processor, it wasn't just like a software company where you know, you'd set up a couple more people at a desk. They have to think about it three years in advance because they've got to build a giant building, which is only made for that specific type of manufacturing. So they want to get as much mileage out of that as they could, so we're encouraged to figure out all sorts of crazy markets for these little processors, right? So uh, when I was there, my job was figuring out stuff like, hey, ATM machines, hmm, I wonder what kind of processors are in those. Hey, can we get Intel, or 
big manufacturer processors in those. Yeah, we could probably do that. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. So the unfun part about this was that we never really got to invent anything. And this, this sort of bummed people out, right? All we were doing was basically marketing and not engineering. So hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had our own chip for other applications that we think are big markets, but you know, we're not yet there. So basically marketing comes up with a bunch of money-making solutions, right? Like, oh, if we had something, a chip that could fit in this like telecommunications board, dude, we'd be rocking. We could make like $100 million a year. And then the people who work on MRI machines are like, dude, if we had a processor for this MRI machine, I could totally do something with that. I could make us a bunch of money. And then everybody gathers all this stuff together, right? And puts it all together. They're like, look, we've got this chip. And it's totally amazing. And it doesn't actually work for any of the solutions at all because it does too much and it's, it's too expensive and it's too hot and you know, all sorts of other problems because we tried to jam too much crap into it because we wanted to please everybody. Instead of picking and choosing which fights were the most important, we wound up with um, something that sort of lost money. So that, that is uh, my personal lesson to you all. Live vicarious through me. Um, so figuring out where you're going is really about consensus. Um, if, you, if people aren't on board, you know, the ship ain't leaving unless they are telling you that you know, I'm definitely not getting on the ship and I'm just going to get on a different boat. Um, you can't really decide that you're going to do something completely unrelated to what you want to do now. Like, so for example, if I am you know, in Fedora, as I am, uh, a, a poor decision for us to make would be to say that we're going to start opening record stores. You know, you need to stay related to what it is that you're doing. So, back to tools. Tools for determining where are we going. Um, surveys, again, uh, the tricky part about surveys is that you can lead people on with your words, like impress upon them, like, I really want you to choose A, and if you want to be unbiased and, and not cause a bunch of drama, um, be careful with your wording. Um, there's lots of discussion tools. You guys have probably seen most of these, wikis and IRC and mailing lists. Um, documentation, again, number one thing to remember. Write down what you're doing, where you started, where you're going, so that everybody understands what the heck it is that you're doing and that it's open, uh, people aren't surprised, like, oh my god, I didn't know this. How come nobody ever told me? Tell them. Remind people, say it multiple times. Don't forget, folks, we're on the boat to wherever. That's how you keep people on board. So the fun part is where you figure out how to get from point A to point B over here, uh, which is things like defining milestones, lengths of time, and the really cool part of letting people take ownership of their tasks. So why do we need milestones? All right, has anyone ever gone out on a hot date with a supermodel? Spot, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> going out on a hot date with a supermodel, right? I have to stop at the Ferrari rental place before I get to supermodel because I will not have success with supermodel if I do not have my faux Ferrari, right? <laughs> if you don't get the Ferrari, your plan is doomed. You probably won't even want to proceed any further, right? So having milestones and sort of a schedule to go along with it um, helps people to see progress in what you're doing. It's good for existing contributors as well as potential contributors and users because they get an understanding of you know how long it's going to be until something happens. Right? If I come to your project and I say, "Hey, where's your? What's your feature plan for the next you know six months?" And, oh, I don't know. Well, are you going to be doing this? You know, fixing this bug? Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe. Well, yeah, we're going to fix it. Well, are you going to do that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe next, you know. People see these things being published. They get the sense that it's sort of an alive project. It's something that they want to use. Um, maybe they will actually be able to see that it's something they can participate in. Maybe that's something that doesn't have an owner, and that's something where they can uh, jump in. So here's a good example of showing a plan with milestones. Um, so this is the map. This is actually him down here under the logo from the page that I borrowed this picture from. I'm going to give it back right afterwards. 
Um, so he sings a song, and it goes, and I'm not going to sing because you guys like your eardrums. Um, he says, if there's some place you want to go, I'm the one you need to know. I'm the map. And then he has some other stuff like that, right? So uh, usually Dora's kind of going from point A to point B. So this is, this is sort of a good example from Dora on Twitter. First, we go through the rainforest. Next, we have to cross Crocodile Lake. And that's how I get to school every morning. Um, so for Dora, it's very clear like where she starts, right? She's over here. Actually, they don't show her in this picture, but you know, she's over here at like Boots' tree house, and she's got to get over here to um, Starbucks. We'll call it Starbucks. So, you know, in this case, it's through a forest and then through probably Crocodile Lake and past a random Mayan pyramid of some sort, and then Starbucks in, in uh, the southern part of this hemisphere. So, um, the other interesting thing that you'll notice about a, a show with Dora is that there, there are obvious time definitions, right? So she has to get from here, the treehouse, to Starbucks between, you know, the start of 30 minutes and the end of 30 minutes, and she knows that she has to get to, you know, the Mayan pyramid thing, uh, like right around the second or third commercial break, you know? And the entire way, she keeps the rhythm going of where are we going? to Starbucks, right? And they sing this song. Every time they hit a milestone, they all cheer, and then they say, yes, now we're going to the next thing. Um, and that's something that you should always remember to do, too, in your community, right? If you never call out that we actually achieved something or that we got somewhere and did something and, you know, we're proud of ourselves, people are going to forget that that was even a milestone. They're going to forget where we're going, and it's going to kind of get back into the uh, boring uh, lull of, eh, we're meandering along, but, you know not really getting anywhere. So, schedules. Who here reads the Fedora project schedule? Oh, please don't do that to me. <laughs> so in my former life, I was the uh, Fedora program manager where I maintained these schedules, and in fact, it's <laughs> still my other job. So um, I am very much uh, familiar with scheduling stuff. So. Um, when you start thinking about building your map and your milestones after you've determined point A and point B, um, you want to think about whether or not you're going to use a feature-based schedule or a time-based schedule. Now, I, I am assuming that based on previous slides that you've actually thought about having a schedule, like the, that might be a good thing to publish, and so if that was what was going through your head, thumbs up to you. Um, feature-based basically means that in order for version X to come out, this following list of things has to be done, right? No matter how long it takes, we're not releasing until we get to here, right? Until all these things are done. Time-based scheduling means that, you know, come hell or high water, we're going to get this puppy out the door by, you know, this date that we have determined far in advance. So feature-based schedules, um, as I said before, it's about having these, these key features for release actually be done. So when you're building this type of schedule, you want to think about things like, how long are these milestones actually going to take us you know, to get there? Um, do we have serious commitment from people to actually do the work? Because if one of them decides that you know, he no longer wants to do this and he's going to start painting for a living, we could be very screwed, right? Um, so you need to have pretty good commitment um, and people who are very willing to, to own up to stuff. So this is something that you see more, I think, in proprietary software and you know, maybe manufacturing, um, you know, because if they don't get somewhere, you know, they're not going to have a physical thing to sell. Um, for you know, us in software, you know, there's less of an impetus to uh, have a you know, go from nothing to having a shiny ball because we have this piece of software that, that sort of slowly evolves over time, but you can't really play with a half-blown up piece of plastic that isn't quite a ball yet, right? Uh, Time-based schedules. So lots of projects use this methodology. Fedora is one of them. Uh, actually, I think most distros are along the same line. Um, other projects, uh, who here has used OpenStack or heard of OpenStack? They do the same thing every six months. Um, so this type of methodology involves a lot of 
working backwards from that, that six month or nine month or you know, whatever their, their cadence is to figure out what they can do between the end and you know, how, much, how much time they can squeeze in between the end and the beginning, basically. Um, the other uh, point from this to remember is uh, that there are dependencies and you really need to understand what all of those dependencies are to actually make an effective schedule. Um, that's really one of the, uh, the big pitfalls, which I will talk about in a second. So who here has experienced feature creep or scope creep or know what those things are? Nice. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that you've heard of them. I'm going to assume you haven't actually experienced them. You've just heard about those things and avoided them. So um, scope creep is, when you're at the project level, uh, the goals that you've set out to accomplish start to just um, magically become like a longer, longer list, right? Like people start slipping things in. Feature creep is pretty similar. Um, it's when your set of required features just starts growing longer. So this could be problematic, right? If you have a feature-based schedule. Uh, you know, we'll just stick one more in, it'll only be another week, or it'll only be another two weeks, and next thing you know, you've got a product that can't come out for seven years because a bunch of people have actually snuck stuff in there, which is not cool. Um, also, you know, with scope, you'll see things that are like, oh, we're gonna do this and it's easy, and then they magically make it more complicated underneath, right? Oh, well, instead of having it connect to like one thing, we're gonna have it connect to 45 things, but no one will ever know, right? Scary stuff. So having what your actual plan is and what, what your features or you know, whatever you wanna call them are, having those things written down and making sure that everyone is in agreement about what that thing actually is, nothing more, nothing less, but exactly what it is, is uh, good because you can really wind up in the situation where it's just never going to ship ever, ever, ever. So I recommend avoiding that. Yes? How do we, uh, are you talking about specific to Fedora? Yeah. Uh, so in Fedora, we actually have a feature submission process uh, where people make a wiki page of their proposed feature. Um, you can come from anybody, uh, but it's basically, you know, what, what is it, what does it do, why is this useful, um, what are some of the uh, implications it may have with, with other pieces of software, what sort of dependencies does it have, you know, who, who, who could this possibly screw up? You know, if I do this, is it going to screw up anyone's life, right? So if I'm doing a new version of a language, right, and we're going to recompile everything with that, you know, it's nice for those people whose stuff is being recompiled to know that that is happening so they can keep their eyes out for that and not be stuck the night before, you know, something saying, you didn't get your stuff done, right? This is sort of what, what this kind of thing tries to avoid. Uh, but after people have made those feature pages, um, Fesco takes them, they review them, um, they vote yes or no, we post them to the feature list, people have to report in uh, at least once a month on the progress that they're making, and they have to be done with their features to a certain degree by a certain date. So a feature freeze, they have to be uh, at least runnable, moderately testable, um, and then there's a feature completion date later on where they have to be 100% done. Um, but there's not really pressure from, it, it's mostly just pressure from people within the community, you know. We all like to see that the things that you're planning on doing get done, and you know, there's pressure to get it done, and you know, also certainly people are saying, you know, oh, you're not getting it done, how can I help you get it done, you know, or are you being blocked by something, how can we, you know, get this done better for you? Does that answer your question? I failed to say what was your question. Uh, <laughs> your question was, uh, does your, do your features come from, the user or do the features come from the user community or from RHEL or, or where do they come from? And I would say they come uh, largely from the, the Fedora community. So there's not a lot of features that come along from end users, I, you know, people who can't do the work. Features are generally proposed 99.999% of the time by the person who's actually going to be doing the work because, you know, I can propose all that I want, but you wouldn't want to ever see any code that I ever wrote because it would be like a shell script saying hello world. So, or maybe a wiki page, but that's not really even code. So, um, did I cut her? Ah, 
Oh, I covered a bit of this just now. So when you're making a schedule, um, number one, and even when you're talking about features, and I just mentioned this, uh, let the people who are doing the work figure out what the heck the features are that they're committing to and how long it's going to take them to do it. Because you know, while it's very easy for me to say, oh, I bet you can rewrite all of Network Manager in like two weeks, right? He's going to kill me if I actually do that because, you know, that's not awesome. He didn't commit to do it. He didn't want to do it. That's nothing he was planning. So having that guy say what he's going to do, or as, in, as we do in Fedora, have him make the feature page is really the way to go. Um, make sure that planning features and advertising of all those features happens, like, in the schedule. Like, that is part of your development process so people understand, as I was saying, uh, I have to propose my features by this date. I have to uh, maybe have my documentation done by this date. Um, if I am somebody else, you know, working in other parts of the distribution or in the other parts of the pieces of software, um, I want to be able to look at everything and know that there, all the stuff that is planned is here on a, by a certain date, right? So I'm not like having to check every day like, oh, I don't know, did something get added or did something get dropped? Like, you know, I don't know, but you know, if you know when that date is by which everything has to be there, you don't have to worry about it. You can go look at it on that day and say, ah, now I know what's going to be affecting me in the future. So I recommend having your schedule start at the beginning. And beginning, I mean not when development begins, but when your planning begins. Um, oh, yes, understanding your dependencies. Uh, knowing your dependencies can make or break your schedule, right? So if I am developing a piece of, let's say, software. There's some other people over here writing documentation. If I decide at some point that, oh, my software is not actually going to be ready um, by a certain point, um, and I don't tell them by a certain point, they're going to assume that everything that was done and said that was going to be done by this uh, specific date actually happened, right? And they may not always hear over here that, oh gosh, that dude who didn't finish his thing didn't tell anybody and I still wrote all of this documentation. Wow, doesn't that feel like a waste of my time? It's not cool. Um, there's all sorts of dependencies that, that happen, right? You don't want to uh, put in a piece of software uh, after you know testing has started. You don't want to uh, do things before, there, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that you just don't want to forget about. Um, partially because, you know, you can really screw things up. The other thing is that sometimes you can just leave people kind of hanging out with, you know, feeling like they don't have anything to do because they're just waiting for, you know, something to happen, but they don't know when it's going to be or if it's going to be. Um, maybe they could be working on something else. They're not really sure. So being able to look at all the dependencies in a chain of what needs to get done um, and what all of those things relationship to the overall schedule is, is, is really helpful. Um, also, uh, if you are doing stuff like, well, basically anything in, in software land, uh, testing, planning, whatever, um, make sure that people are, are kind and that they you don't say, oh yeah, you know, somewhere in here all the software needs to be done, and then we'll do the testing, right? Make sure you pick a date. Make sure that that date isn't like one day for everything else to magically happen, right? You're not going to document and test and, and do everything in, in one day. Um, and don't do it like, oh, whoops, we didn't realize it was Christmas Eve. Oh, sorry about that. I, you know, there are other outside factors that you probably want to consider. Like if you were doing a big project at a university, you know, don't make the release date the day before graduation or the day after graduation. That's just, you know, bad. So think about, you know, some of the little outside things in the world that happen as well. Um, publishing schedules. So this goes back to the uh, transparency stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, putting it out there, you know, detail, but not overwhelming, scary, non-understandable detail. You know, you need it to be pretty understandable. That's helpful. Uh, ownership, which is a great thing. You know, you like to see people having pride in what they do, taking ownership for what they do. Um, make sure that those owners are 
out there documented, so there's no question about who the heck was supposed to do that. How, you know, I, did, I said I wasn't going to be able to do that, and you, know, you just assumed I was going to. No, just put it over there. Make sure somebody feels empowered to take it and, and write it down. Uh, know, making sure people know deadlines, making sure they know what the major milestones are, like here is when we're starting development. This is where development ends. You, know, you don't need to get into the nitty gritty stuff, uh, but you know, basic stuff like this, testing, you know, the, the big things, having that stuff out there, you know, things like betas, alphas, et cetera, helps everybody to be more or less on the same page. You know, maybe specific teams have more detailed schedules. We do that in Fedora, but not everybody in, you know, say release engineering knows what's going on in marketing. Um, but we know that we do have some, some synchronization points like when the alpha happens after he's made the, uh, the image that we upload somewhere, then marketing says, yay, it's out there, right? You know, if, if, if he doesn't, if we don't know that he's doing that, then we might do something ridiculously stupid. Um, making it public, again, make sure everybody knows where it is, how to find it, they know that a schedule exists, et cetera. So, enforcing the schedule. I used to have a whip. It was really enjoyable. I don't have it anymore. It makes me sad, but it's okay. So, I hear this question all the time. How what the hell do you get people to do things on time when they're volunteering? Well, that's an excellent question, right? Because, you know, this is an open source project, and you don't really, you know, it's not like I'm the boss, and I tell them, and they say, oh, God, if I don't do what she says, I'm not going to be eating, because it's not true at all, right? Um, so I think the number one thing is to ensure that people always have sort of a sense of, of ownership and pride in what they're doing, um, and definitely leadership, you know, not that they're just doing something and, and no one cared, but, you know, that, that's something that they're, they're really owning up to, uh, uh, for, um, that they're leading, you know, they're the champion of. Um, making sure that people how, understand, like, how their pieces affect other people's pieces. Uh, things like checking in, like, hey, I noticed that you haven't updated your feature page in, like, six months despite my constant harassment, so I'm going to pick up the phone and call you. Um, becoming an announcement guru. You know, I'm queen of announcements. I have, literally have a, a folder of, like, copy-paste, you know, things that I do, and sometimes that backfires because I'll forget to change the year or something, but I do my best. <laughs> uh, public discussions of progress, like mustard, you know, are we getting places? Um, even in meetings, you know, when you ask people, like, hey, how's this thing coming? You know, people don't always like to admit that they're falling behind. And I think it's good to remind people that, that it's okay. Like, we would rather know now rather than eight months from now that, that you're behind, right? Uh, because that's how you can get help. That's how we can put, you know, a second plan in place. Like, you know, what's the backup plan? What's the contingency, contingency plan if this doesn't happen? Um, peer pressure fits in a little bit here, but, um, you know, you don't want to paint someone to be, like, the ruiner of all good things in the universe, right? Like, oh, well, if you don't do this, then the universe is going to crumble. That's not really, you know, going to give anyone a warm fuzzy by any means. Um, but, you know, offer people help. Like, even if you can't give the help, like, how can I help you find help? You know, could you give me a shortened version of what it is that you're looking for? Um, those types of things go a long way and just making sure that people feel good about the pieces that they own and I think encourages them more to actually stick with what they've promised to in the schedule. So at some point in here, I, I told you that there were promises of tools, right? So um, not all schedules are complicated. Uh, sometimes it's like a three-person project, right? You're not building an operating system. so having something incredibly scary or large or detailed isn't really necessary, right? So wiki page, web page, that kind of stuff may be all you need just with basic stuff, you know, milestones, release dates. What are we planning for the future? Here's when it's going to be done by or here's when, you know, we're hoping it's going to be done by, et cetera. Um, even if your schedule is complicated, you still want to make those things public so that everybody understands. I keep repeating this stuff about transparency and openness, but it's not a crock. It's really true. Um, for more complicated things, um, where you want to understand dependencies, where there's lots of people involved, um, I recommend using some sort of a scheduling tool, right? So uh, the answer to all your problems is not Microsoft Project. Um, I know that that is probably what most people learned about at some point, like in college, 
you know, they took some sort of course, they learned about project, or at some point their boss said, you know, I need you to get in project and estimate your number of hours on all of these things, and they're, so we're not going to be talking about Microsoft Project today, right? We're going to talk about something called Task Juggler, which is what I use, and it is an open source scheduling tool, very similar to Evilville up at the top there. Um, it manages all sorts of stuff, all the things that you would really like to be able to manipulate, right? So tasks, right? You know, you want to know what all those things are and what, you know, the length. They can be days, they can be weeks, they can be hours, they can be minutes, whatever. Resources, who are the people? working on this stuff, or what is the, the team assigned to this stuff, uh, dependencies and relationships between certain tasks, uh, scenarios, you know. If we have 100 people working on this and everything goes hunky-dory, uh, or if the company goes under and we only have 10 people because we had to fire everybody else, you know, how's that going to affect uh, the length of this, you know, in, in this case it would probably be a, a feature-based uh, product. Uh, multiple time zones. I know that you know lots of companies have people who are working all over the place, and if you're doing stuff like we're all working for eight hours a day here, there, and everywhere, you can account for what those are in different places. So that for people running very tight schedules, or they're doing testing and you know overnight work and that kind of stuff, it uh, can make better sense of that. Accounting. If you actually keep track of how much stuff costs, which you know, it doesn't always happen in open source land, but, you know, sometimes people say, oh, this, these engineers cost, whatever, $200 an hour, and, you know, by the end of the project, we'll know how much this bad boy took to put together in terms of our money and how much we're going to have to pray that we make that back. Um, dependencies. Yeah, I should read my slides more carefully. Um, and finally, uh, for people who like to see output in something other than a giant tool, um, you know, it, it outputs in in HTML pages, which is where the majority of people look at, you know, how things are done in Fedora when they go to look at the schedule. Um, but you can also do things like, like pull, pull the schedule into your calendar. So, you know, if you say, oh, I am an engineer, I need to pull the engineering calendar into my calendar, and then it will, will pop up every day and remind you of all the work you have to do. So, hopefully, by this point, you should have a reasonable understanding of how to decide a couple things in an open source project. And you should know about some free and open source software tools that you can use to do all of these cool things and figure out where you want to go and know where you are and, you know, once you've got all that sorted out, how you can uh, actually do this. Um, I also hope that you've learned a couple things about Dora. Um, what she teaches small children how to actually apply that. Um, most of this was lessons from, you know, my life and Dora and my mommyhood and my past experiences, but I hope that uh, some of this can help you to do planning the open source way for the future. So, does anyone have any questions? You have to love him. He's beautiful. Question. I will repeat your question, too. Uh, have you ever used or tried to use any Agile or Scrum-style you know, management techniques, or if not, why? Uh, not in Fedora. Um, I've, I've seen it happen in other projects with, with varying degrees of success. Um, no one's really ever proposed it in Fedora as, you know, how we're, how we're actually going to do things. Um, I think it varies from project to project and, and how well people are tuned into those kinds of, you know, management techniques. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it varies. You know, I see some projects, you know, doing it reasonably well. I see others doing it and, you know, it, it, they almost move so fast that no one, you know, I always think that one of the most important things that a project can do is get it's software like into a distribution so that people can actually try it, not just like have their own repo or they hope that, you know, it's being kept up to date, but literally put it in these other pieces of, you know, these other distributions proper. And I noticed that a lot of folks who use those kinds of methodologies, they don't ever really think about doing that. And they don't ever really have like a firm release, right? I mean, there's like a release every two weeks or every month, but no one, 
you know, people who go to explore it don't always have a good sense of like, oh, this is definitely the, the big stable thing that we're doing, right? You know, you put stuff in a distribution, you want it to be, you know, working for the foreseeable future, right? You know, you want it, you know, for Fedora, you probably want it to be okay for the next year or so. You know, you're doing agile stuff. You, you know, a lot of times people just keep going and they don't think about this branch. You know, it, it wasn't even a branch. It's just, you know, something that they left behind while they kept going. So, you know, a lot of it just depends on how thorough people are. I see a lot of non-thoroughness. I've seen lots of, you know, very thoroughness and lots of care for distributions, you know, for people who use those kinds of techniques. So, you know, I think a, a lot of scheduling stuff is not so much about, you know, the tool or the method you use, but, you know, whether or not the people who are doing the actual work pay attention to any of it at all. So, and do things in the, in the spirit of, you know, what, what it is that you're doing. Questions? Oh, hi, John. Um, I would say alcohol, but that would be a terrible thing to say. Um, I already tried that. So, not, not entirely, you know, I think there are certain points in the cycle where everybody is, is burned out. Um, I don't really think that the key to solving that is, you know, maybe sometimes it is that, you know, we're just trying to do too much in too short of a period of time. Um, and those are things that you would generally want to talk about, like in a post-mortem, like the QA post-mortem, for example. Like, guys, you know, we just can't do this. You know, four days is not enough to get from, from here to here without us, you know, not actually sleeping. And we're humans and we need to get, you know, more than three hours a night during this time frame or two hours a night or whatever. Um, but I know that there's also sort of a tendency for people to just always give it their all. Um, I think in those cases, sometimes it's, it's on the project leader or the team leader or whomever to say, look, you as a person are more important than getting this thing out the door. I want you people to sleep because that's how we do things better. You know, we're not just trying to get something out the door. We're also a community of people who actually care about each other. And so, you know, if it's a continual problem and it really does burn people out when they don't sleep, you know, and it's, you know, three times a cycle and it sucks, you know, someone eventually needs to say, dude, this sucks, um, and figure out how you can actually go about changing it. Sometimes that's actually doing the scheduling stuff, making it work better, or sometimes it's simply, you know, telling people, hey, you know, you need to sleep. We're still going, you know, the world's not going to implode without you. Go to bed. So that is my solution for that, which isn't really much of a solution. It's more of a, a human touchy-feely solution, but, you know, I think it's the truth, so. No. 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 Oh, I do at some point, but no. I don't think any FPLs ever really had to be a tiebreaker. Is that true, Paul? It, it, consensus. You know, I think people do a good job of, of socializing and, and, and gathering people around an idea before they, you know, just toss it up there for you know people to vote on. Uh, you know, I think if if that was the case, that more. There would probably be lots of tie-breaking stuff, but I think people, you know, want to make sure people are on board before they get totally flamed by, you know, flying tomatoes. So. You mentioned the task juggler and the, the wiki. Task juggler, yes. Did, do you uh, do things like man, mind mappers or note-taker tools? Um, I have used uh, a number of mind mappers before. Um, Xmind is the one that I have used and I really like. Um, I haven't done that with relationship to the schedule, but, you know, with various, like, you know, oh, there might be a problem in the schedule. Hmm, let's think about, you know, all these little details that we might want to think about while we're trying to figure out how to solve this problem in the schedule. Like, you know, what, what are all the things that occurred? Uh, just so you can see them and see their relationships to each other. Um, I know some people, for tasks, some people like, um, I know there's more, more web-based ones, like Remember the Milk, 
a uh, couple other things like that. Um, I, I tend to be really bad, and I know this is going to sound terrible. I'm, I really like writing things down sometimes, so, or I do it in notepad. I have a, you know, I have a diary file, which is literally just, you know, my notes of this, that, and the other since, like, you know, years and years and years ago, just, you know, oh, yeah, I did that once. Here, let me just search for this word, and, you know, here's what it is, but, um, yeah, I like mind mapping stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, a lot of people don't. Yeah. So keep it simple, stupid. I believe is is, is a, a a Paul Friedelism that I learned at one point. Oh, He's you. rolling his eyes at me. All right, is that it? Keynote. Oh. Saturday survey again. Yay. Which is also your raffle ticket, which will be drawn at the keynote. What are you guys here. giving away? Pardon? What are they giving away this year? Uh, hot dogs. Hot dogs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have no idea. I'm not privy to that information. All right. Let's, oh. Um, I missed the first part of your talk, but. Uh, okay. The role of the Fedora project leader. Um, yes, I did talk about this at the beginning. So the role of Fedora project leader is to, uh, I like to think of it as, as leading by consensus, perhaps. You know, gathering people around ideas to, to move, move things forward. I'm also sort of the uh, connection point between the project and uh, the internal bowels of Red Hat, if you will. Um, you know, it's just sort of a, a line of communication. You know, I, I'm basically responsible for, for telling them if things are going poorly, but lately I mostly just tell them how awesome we are, which has been really cool. So it's been the bulk of my, my job in the past couple of months since I started. Does that fully answer your question? I don't think I've actually repeated the question once, so <laughs> sorry, camera. Yes, that answers my question. Okay, excellent. I tried. Anyone else? Going once? All right. All right, you got. Oh, no, no, no. He has a question, though. You want to come up and ask the question? It depends on, you know, I, I think for, for engineers it, it's, it's less sticky, but, you know, it depends on how floss friendly the, the people in, I hate to call them the suits, but, you know, a lot of times people in marketing are very much into, you know, PowerPoint presentations and, you know, very shiny things that are not running on a Linux desktop. I think that is probably the biggest barrier. I don't really think that there's a, a big technical barrier you know, in terms of, you know, feature parity between the two. It's, you know, are these folks going to actually be able to use the tool because it's on a Linux desktop? Oh, so it's not web-based or anything that actually requires a Linux desktop? Uh, well, you can, if you are not a person who is, like, typing things into it, yeah, there's web UIs, there's all sorts, you know, you can look at, at stuff there, but, um, yeah, you know, I think it just depends on what those people are doing with it. You know, if they have to come and sit and, you know, type things in or, you know, provide their pieces of the schedule or if the person who maintains the schedule is in a part of the organization that is not engineering, basically. Yeah, that might be. Eh. I'm actually trying to remember if Task Juggler may actually have a, a Windows version and it probably says on taskjuggler.org, uh, which I would get to on the internet later. <laughs> uh, folks, we, uh, the mechanics have to get out of the room because it needs to uh, explode again. Woo! Can I stand here and just do this while the... <laughs>
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments.
you have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center, uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.